that we had also been able to see some audiovisual representation of uh, uh, personal works and the history of the visual art. And uh, now we are starting the uh, third session on the, of the first day of the World Theatre Forum. And we are extremely happy that we have uh, as chair none other than Mohan Maharishi. Mohan Maharishi is not only the senior, one of the senior most theatre director of the country, but uh, he has contributed in making theatre from all kinds of material, from plays, from novels, from uh, other uh, related texts. And uh, his plays uh, had always remained between uh, 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 remained at the crossroad of dif different perspectives of narrative. There were visual narrative, textual narrative, the narrative through the scenography, the narrative to the speech of the actors, uh, the uh, narratives uh, that is built between the performance and the uh, audience. And uh, over last almost five decades, we have looked at his work astonishingly uh, surprised. And he had also remained the director of National School of Drama. His extensive work in Mauritius and other countries has inspired many, many generations of artists. Uh, we are very happy to have him here. And, uh, We have three speakers for uh, today's post-lunch session. Uh, we have Mr. Stephen Blaske. Dr. Stephen Blaske is dramaturg of Melo Rao and the IIPM, International Institute of Political Murder. Uh, that's very intriguing. He studied theater and media studies, philosophy, politics, and administration studies in Germany and France, and wrote his PhD at the University of Vienna, Austria, about self-reflection and media reflection in contemporary theater. He worked at the State Theater Residence Theater in Munich and was teaching at several universities and art schools. With Milo Rao, he worked at Schaubune Berlin, Schauspielhaus Zurich, and others. Their productions were invited, uh, for example, to uh, Kunstein Festival Brussels, Brussels and Theater Treffen Berlin, and worldwide presented in more than 20 countries. The theater critics of Germany, Australia, Austria, and Switzerland, Theater Oite, elected Stephen Blaske, the dramaturg of the year in 2017. Uh, and of course, we have with us none other than uh, Professor Dr. Rajiv Lochen. A uh, practicing artist, Professor Dr. Rajiv Lochan, former director, National Gallery of Modern Art, had been at the helm of affairs of the institution for over 16 years. The aim of Professor Lochan had been, taken, had been to take art beyond the four walls of any institution and engage the mass in vibrant cultural activities. He has mounted innumerable exhibitions and had contributed enormously in the academic realm both nationally and internationally. Having taught for over two decades and lectured at various forums, he has extensively contributed to the larger understanding of creative expression, both the level of the masses as well as the academic discipline. Having been conferred a DLIT from Kyoto City University of Arts and awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Omani Society of Fine Arts, along with many other awards as part of his recognition in the discipline. A very, very warm welcome to you. And we are also very happy to have uh, Professor Sandeep Chatterjee. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, Professor Sandeep Chatterjee is a filmmaker and teacher of cinema whose work spans around 25 years. He is a distinguished alumnus of the Film and Television Institute of India, FTII, Pune, where he is currently the head of the Department of Direction and Screenwriting. Apart from Sundar Jiban, a film based on a story by iconic Bengali poet Sri Jibanananda Das, in which, incidentally, this is not a part of the biodata, but in which, incidentally, I played a role, uh, that has won the national award from the President of India. 
Sandeep has made influential films like Raat Kato Holo based on a story by Sri Afsar Ahmed. Sandeep Chatterjee's films have been screened at film festivals across the country. He has taught in various film schools and has conducted workshops and lecture sessions in India and abroad. His focus, wherever he goes, is on making the art of cinema more accessible. Mm -hmm. So with such uh, luminaries of uh, people uh, in the panel and the chair, I won't stand between you and them. I would request uh, Professor Maharishi to kindly take the uh, chair and uh, recite the session. Distinguished and eminent scholars, Professor Rajiv Lochan, Professor Sandeep Chatterjee, and Mr. Stefan Plaske, <coughs> who was with me in a session just before this. Well, unfortunately, I have missed, almost completely missed, the first and second sessions, uh, otherwise I would have been more enlightened. Uh, I have been doing theatre, writing for theatre, original plays as well as many translations, adaptations, uh, for last 50 years I have been working in theatre. It is because I could do nothing else. I know nothing else except making theatre. <coughs> if there are any takers or buyers, I am ready to, to be there, you know, to make theatre. I don't know of any other thing that I could have done. In the last session, I saw some eminent people discussing narrative, trying to dissect it, trying to understand what a narrative is. It was a little bit difficult to follow uh, for me because I had just come for the last five minutes or so. But I am sure with these distinguished speakers and this wonderful audience, we will be able to have new insight into this problem of narrative. So with these small words, I happily invite Rajiv Lochan to come. Give his presentation, Rajiv Locha. Father was an old-time student of 
some of the stars in this country. And when I would go back home and try and tell him what I was doing in the context of my painting, he would turn around to me and say, an expression which needs an expression to explain that expression is that bloody expression. <laughs> <laughs> it's no expression. Don't make cock in those stories. That's what KG Subramanian, this great son word. So I, all my life, have caught between the word, which I love using, only in trying to understand the larger meaning of the number. Let's see my And I debated because I thought that since I was running wireless, maybe it'd be easier if I show you <coughs> a whole set of images that talk silently. And then try me to read wherever I so desire to tell you my interpretation. I don't care what your interpretation is. Because I firmly believe. Ideas can be hyperbolic, and they need to be governed by their own meaning, uh, by their own logic, to formulate their own meaning. That's it, promise. I'm ready to argue with you if I have the energy left. But then, it's all about freedom. It's all about freedom of expression. I also believe. Fantasy is the basis of all hypotheses. As much applicable to science as it is to art. <coughs> because creativity is a common denominator. No, it's about that kira. Uh, allow me to use it here and try and translate it somewhere. It's that worm inside you. That worm embedded that we talked about, I think you you had mentioned about the idea and the concept. <laughs> it's a very agile worm. Sometimes it gives you hints and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it comes out spontaneously and sometimes you try hard to get it out and it doesn't come out. Anyway, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to life. We're all struggling with the need to struggle. I also believe uh, in this wonderful quote by Noel when Marx and Proust said, each one of us is similar and dissimilar to each one of us. As many as there are eyes and minds that awaken every morning. Now my addition, the role of a creator is to provide an image to it. Our observations are not mere passive records. And mine, I also believe, but what you have is what you have. And that's what you have. <laughs> nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. Can I have a glass of water? I need it because I'm already sweating. Yeah. 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 Uh, therefore, I think it was an intelligent choice that I have a whole set of about 60, 70 slides from Indian artists from prehistory. Many of them that you have known, many of them may have not known. And I take that course. And I was telling uh, Para, he didn't send me slides of Rebecca Hall and Fluxus the two exhibitions that I have organized. Uh, to be able to add to this, I'm also happy to share with you that I'll take you through this code right onto the Rats Media and Dumb Tide. I've had the great privilege of working with Dumb Tide and I've raised the founder member of the group. And I'll show you some uh, astounding examples of the early works of uh, Dumb Tide. Mom, word. The word only supports. Huh? in the entire process. Of course, I like talking, so I can talk and interject as and when where possible. Is Kudra Bada coming? Before, uh, uh, in fact, I will ask to send the synopsis of mine, which I did only yesterday. I don't know whether, and I would like to read that. You want the image to be large? Yeah, yeah, it, it has to be large. Otherwise, there's no point in the image. Okay, I'll talk in the meantime. The image and the word have innate capacity to transcend beyond common experience 
and logic to portray those realms of expression which are only accessible to the finer aspects of experience at the instinctive and intuitive level. I wrote this last evening in St. The non-verbal and the verbal, as per the appropriate utilization, creates an orchestrization of concepts, ideas, and experiences, both at the emotive, psychological, as well as the intellectual level, weaving various strategies to create the overall perceptive experience. It is interesting how the image sands the word. Yeah. It is interesting how the image sands the word, sands, and enables the onlooker to delve deeper into the experiential mode in the entire evolution of creative expression, both in the visual as well as the literary context. The engagement today is essentially to chart a selective course from this pantheon with some unique facets of creative expression as part of our evolution and enumerate their strengths and strategies that have culminated in some outstanding creative expressions. It's a long journey with diverse modes of creative expression, unique in their context, from prehistory until some current cutting-edge strategies that have evolved as notable facets of the expression in the visual as well as literary arts. Articulating the verbal and the non-verbal. I call it in the seeds of It's time. And these are visuals that elaborate upon the whole context and of course it's impossible to show you all what is possible. Some interesting facets. You don't even need to change it. Yeah, well thank you so very much. Did the prehistoric man? I raise questions, I answer very few. The reason being that my answer is my answer and your answer shall be yours and there's no reason why my answer should be your answer. Did this prehistoric man ever desire to be a painter? What was he painting for? What was he trying to merit? Suppose you wish to say that the terrain that you live in is extremely hostile. The animal that you are trying to hunt which will help you to survive. The next two months is extremely ferocious. Remember to be agile. Remember to be that the only susceptible spots are the forehead and the neck. If you manage to kill him, you have a ball. If you don't, be prepared to you lose your life. These are my words. <laughs> These are my narratives. I was only trying to infer what he tried. He didn't want to be a painter. He used this non-verbal, powerful language. And I tried to articulate it through words that are approximations of what they experience. Next, please. Next, my friend. Tell her. No, no. I, I, I like telling stories. When Herbert Reed, Sir Herbert Reed, mounted the first exhibition of child art, he called some of the top artists in the world. Because the relevance of prehistoric art, the relevance of child art, was completely redundant. You are a old bad art that children do what is there in it. And he invited Picasso. Picasso came in. And he did not even notice her read. He was so engrossed looking at the works. And you will see that most of Picasso's works are all inspired by African art and other forms. And then Herbert Reed nudged Picasso and asked him, what do you think? And what a brilliant answer. That sums it up. I could paint like a file when I was a child, but it took me a whole lifetime to paint like them. Next, please. Yeah. I think the unfortunate part is that uh, we try to understand works. And I don't think there is any need to understand works. It is most important to be able to experience a work. And I think that is what binds both the, the experience. 
The next, please. Yeah, that's important. Do it. Epitome of reality. You pick up from Greek terms. The culmination of physicality as opposed to the culmination of spirituality in our context. Next slide, please. Yes, epitome of spirituality. Abhaya. Do not fear. Now I'd like to go back here. Vishnu Dharmatra Puran Chitra Sutra. And here's a question. How many hundred years did it actually take for the first image of Buddha, an iconography image of Buddha, to evolve? Around 500 years. Why? What the hell were the artists and the conceptualizers doing? They were working on texts. Vishnu Dharmottara Puran, Chitra Sutra, how would the eyes be like finding similes for pictorial representation of that iconic representation? Yeah? Hmm? The verbal and the non-verbal. No, I'm trying to establish my premise. Yeah? And because I'm, I am from India, so obviously I would like to bank a pound and share some of those sets that I look at. Although I hated the National Gallery of Modern Art, I always said, I mean, how can modern or contemporary be devoid of tradition? <laughs> because it's a continuum. It is what grows from here, integrated, and the relevance of modernity is contextual to the land that you live in. It is not that you wear Western glasses and say that is Western and that is European and this is modern. The relevance of modernity is Although we also argue the universality of modernity, that's the real question. But I think it's important to understand. Hmm. If I say, if I use four, four lines, Jahi, Anadi, Ananta, Akhanda, Acheda, Abhedi, Suveda, Batave, Tahi, Ahiri, Kichohari, Yancha, Chiyavar, Chach, Pinach, Najari. Imagine, you know, Krishna, Krishna, the playful God, Jahi, Anadi, what does Anadi mean? Endless. Ananda, Akhand, monumental, Achel, who cannot be penetrated, whose values and whose, uh, you know, virtuosity cannot be truly understood. Ananda, Akhand, Achel, cannot be penetrated. Abhed, Jinke Bhed, because the variety of the interpretations cannot be truly understood. So, Vedavata, as is described in the text, and he's so simple and playful and spontaneous. It's called spontaneity. It's about that subtle lucidity that theater equally talks about, and so does art, and so does film. And we'll eventually come back to film, come a culminating film. You know? So it's that. And who's so simple and supple. That simple little girls with little cutorings and little bowels are able to you know, playfully maneuver this monumental fact. See, any other imagining? Has anyone seen Shiva? Has anyone seen Ram? No, it's conceptualization of what you perceive that phenomena to be. And that is what Indian art is all about. That is what. And interestingly, it's funny, no? I mean, we're talking about artistry. I made a statement in the afternoon when you're having lunch. Inference. How it still infer. The funny and the interesting thing is that iconography and these texts were common to both so-called Brahminical, China and Buddhist. Therefore the iconography is similar. Hmm? And the best works of Buddhist art have actually never happened during Buddhist times. The best works of Jain art have never happened during Buddhist times. And what is this word called Brahminical? These are words only coined for our convenience. And I think let's keep them at the back of our mind and only come to it. That's the point I wish to make. It's about drawing the essence. You know, because not narrative, verbal, and non-verbal. Thanks, slide, please. Yeah. And what a confluence. I'm sorry, this title is wrong. Not Gandharu, it is Gandhara. How the Western and the Far Eastern and the Indian sensibility come together to create this image of Buddha. And to me, let me tell you, as an artist, the narrative and this thing is dominated by the pictorial language, the language of expression that you evolve conceptually. It is that that dictates 
Next, please. Yeah, miniature. Now, try to analyze. I'm a Western eye, always said, oh, miniature painting, it doesn't look real, what is this, outdated. There's a very fine book by Parthomita that writes about much maligned monsters. Its title is Much Maligned Monster. All Indian gods, all Indian goddesses are monstrous. Because, but then monstrous, but it's in our blood, it's in our system. Mythification of reality, that's what we have grown with. And this iconography has been, has grown from the conceptual framework of the narrative. That's the point I wish to make. Now, if I had to say, forget this painting, if I had to say that a crow picks up a morsel of bread from the precincts of the National School of Drama, decides to go around wandering in Monday house, hmm? enters the gate where the guard says, stop, comes out and says, wants to join us in, the, in this conference, is it possible in realistic art? It's not, but in miniature it is. Hmm. Because the narrative dictates the image. And the layering and the structure of the form is all based on the orchestration of what the concept tries to, to portray and depict. Hmm? And so, so there are ways, and, and mind you, I mean that can also be one kind of abstraction, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not that uh, this Western concept of abstraction is what we need to wear as glasses. Next, please. Now, what a, what a fab, I love this work. This is Queen and King Edward during company period. Now imagine the miniature painter now and it is made to face the European audience that doesn't relate to uh, this mythification of reality and iconography, and the, and the and he wishes to be portrayed like used to be during that time. Uh, see, the portrait is realistic; the rest of it is all. Confluence. And that's the reason why I say the visual language. And I chose to use this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel it is ridiculous to try and describe things or visually experience the most, but then we need to kind of have this. Next, please. Hamza Nama. Dastanya Me Hamza. Complete narrative, complete story, picturization. And when we were talking at lunch in the Udyanji, I was talking, I was thinking about, you know, Babar Nama, Hamza Nama. I mean, I think it was all politically motivated and interpreted. You know what needs to be focused, how, <laughs> etc., etc. Yeah. What needs to be emphasized? And you can see John here with the holo. Hello, at the back. You know? <laughs> what is that? Next. Yeah, coming in at the British to the kettle, dancers, the notch girls. Hmm? Now, very interestingly, visual language and pictorial language, the Western painters had never experienced light to be so luminous in India. That India was so colorful in India. So the entire representation of reality is all browns and yellows of the pale kind. Hmm? Next, please. Yeah. Now, I wanted to compare this with Rono's Bosch. <coughs> yeah. See, see, now, is this orchestration of space, which is like, in a way, close to miniature painting? <laughs> Except that, miniature, I call miniature painting more conceptual. Although the, the meaning and definition of the word conceptual has, is very different by Western standards. Next, please. Yeah, then our story, narrative. Mm. And India is the most fertile ground for the confluence of both these things. European academicism and conceptualism. Next, please. Yes, William Blake. In fact, this was an area of my great interest in my master's thesis. William Blake, Flight of Azuburas, because my work was elements of fantasy in contemporary Indian art. The moment there was any element of fantasy which had some imagination, people would call it surya. India had never experienced the surya. India had never, so for that matter, would our Kali be surya? Huh? 
with any of our gods and goddesses. So I had to set up a complete logic and see what happened in this transformation, what were the trends in film, what were the trends in literature, what were the trends in poetry, what were the trends in, you know, and how this is, all this influenced the Indian sense of it. Next. Yeah, I love this work, a little work. Very sensitive work called The Journey's End. Next. Please tell me when my time is over. Yeah. I can tell. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One of our most outstanding artists who was trained in the Western media, the Brahmacharis, Anita Shergo, studied in Paris. <coughs> Next. Ravini Nartego. I purposely picked up this work. Caricature, humor, and satire. No, no, here's a whole series. Gaganilna, to my mind, was most uh, enlightened. Next. Tagore. How much, uh, yes. much time is to be given to one speaker? In fact, uh, we've all heard of uh, Ocampo, who actually motivated uh, uh, Ravindna Tagore to paint at the ripe age of 60 plus. And uh, Tagore did a whole series of portraits and caricatures and my interpretation is I organized 11 exhibitions of Ravindna Tagore all over the world. And to me, this is a portrait of Ocampo. It is not trying to portray the physical portrait of Ocampo, but it is about the inner personality of Ocampo, who was a great poetess from Argentina. And there are caricatures, and I always interpret it as that he's, what he could not say in words, mind me, please, what he could not say in words is what he brought out in caricature about people that he wanted to be nice to. <laughs> Next, please. <laughs> You see the whole, to me, this is how I see the narrative. Coming in from life, going back to life. Next. This again, Ramkinka badge, a portrait of Tagore. Next. This is only, I have made this selection as cross-referencing, trying to see how the, the visual language, inter, this is called the tree lover. Next. Yeah. How Tantra inspired artists. Again, the word and the image. Next. Yes. Hmm? Old man in the red. The grand old man of art. Now it's so descriptive. It is so descriptive. I mean, you can't see, actually see a parrot uh, reciting out to him. Babesh Sanya, the parrot reciting out in the ear. It's, I'm almost reminded of uh, Jayasi, the poet, Hiramantota and Malik Mohammed Jayasi, mm. and Raja Ratan Sen. And this Hiramantota is all the time, you know, pe -pe 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 telling, describing the beauty of this Hermia, beauteous Hermia called uh, as synonymous of God. Next. Next, please. Yeah. I purposely put Satish Bajra. This is his most powerful period, the partition. The agony of partition, despair. Most. And mind you, you can also compare this because he, was, he went to, uh, to Mexico and, was a content, well, and studied under Orozco and Securus. I'm coming down to politics. <laughs> Next. Yeah, this is Rasa. Mm -hmm. You know, Shunya, nothingness, Bindu, mm -hmm. that encapsulates everything. Uh, nothingness is not nothing, it is everything. Next. Yes, Hussain. Again, the narrative, no return. Next. Uh, actually, it spells life. It's like a still from a film. Next. Avinash Chandra. 
these are all some of those landmark works which have evolved in our country as part of creating their own language. Next. Ah, Sousa. Francis Newton and Sousa reinterpreting uh, mythological sequences, the Christian mythological sequences. Next. For a Next. Malwa Knights. K.G. Subramanian, my own professor who told me as I started with, don't make cock and bull stories. Know exactly what you wish to say and find the way you wish to see it, to realize it. Next. Krishnakanta. Bandwala. How a very simple bandwala out on the streets can be a very serious philosophical mode of expression that gives deeper insight into the plight, human condition, etc., etc. So, so, in other words, I'm talking, I'm addressing all these intellectual, psychological, emotive uh, modes of expression. Next. Tayam Mehta, Shantini Ketan Triptik. And mind you, when I, I'm purposely showing this word, because in Shantini Ketan, Ram Kinkar Bed, Rabindranath Tagore, they all you know, including uh, Vinod Bihari Mukherjee, they designed painted sets for theatre. I thought I'd mention this here. How art as a visual sensibility takes over, uh, you know, completely transforms. This can be a wonderful backdrop for a Next. Anjali Lavani. Next, Ghulam Muhammad Sheikh. I'm witness because I was there. The topographical, now see a takeoff from folk art, private, child art, miniature painting, color, this, that. And the real experienced narrative, the lived narrative. Meghdut was the name of the building where I used to stay. Next, this is another painting. I can go on and talk about, but I, I think what I'm more interested in right now is to establish the premise and the latitude. Thanks. Yeah, book and book, man with a bouquet of flowers. In fact, I just recently curated an exhibition of 128 works of Bhupen Kakkar. How this man he observed everyday reality and made that narrative of the everyday you know, uh, and, you know, as a theme of his creative expression. Next. This is again Bhagavan. Gay. How he sees the world. Next. Swami. Bimb Pratibhim. You know, how would, would one translate that, Bindu Pratibhim? Udhyanji? Reflection and? Reflection and counter reflection. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Next. Jangir Sarovada, the metaphysical. Track lakes. Metaphor. So my aim right now is essentially to give you a hint into the narrative and it's to let you experience the way. You know? Next. Iran Jamil. He draws essentially from not you see he also draws essentially from the the iconography and the lived experience. Next. Vikash Bhattacharya. Fantasization of reality, the experienced reality. Next. Manjeet Baba, Krishna, and the 
<laughs> the eternal flare, drawn from Indian mythology back to Next, Paramjit Singh, the metaphysical path. Next, Arpita Singh. Now it's so wonderful. Arpita's paintings again, again draw from the everyday experience story <laughs> that happens in life. In the narrative. So that's why I say it doesn't matter. I always believe in this. It doesn't matter where you buy your chicken from. What matters is what is it that you do to it or with it. At the end of the day, it's the taste. And I think that's the crux of my, my thesis. Next. So what Bhutta was exhibition again I had organized. This is called Dada, the eternal dream. Next. Ah, Rux Media. I'm very proud of my students. And, uh, <laughs> and as I said, along with them, I would have loved to show you images of uh, Rebecca Horn and Fluxus and many others, but it's not about trying to show you that all this is available on the net. Hmm? And uh, then I'll read a small little piece on Rux, on time, which has its own narrative. And, in fact, I was lucky, I just got a catalog from them, a recent one, three days ago. I would browse through it as, hey, that's that, it fits, it fits in so well. Okay. In, it, in Rux Media's collective recent publication, Twilight Language, Theodore Ringberg, in his article, Just Time, in New Age, around seven years had passed since I buried a time capsule that Rux Media collective filled with things that things had to do with as later encounters. The state of play between the ways in which the collective innovates and presents, interprets the past and faces the future. None but they know exactly what these things are. The capsule is intended to be re-earthed into 2061 and its contents exhibited alongside objects from other artists' stand capsules that I've buried. Perhaps you will see why, given that drugs put forward in this practice, or not only time, but a debt of labor and waiting rooms and the cherished conversation on time that one has embarked in anticipation of their capsule. I quote, I am here taking, taken to try to expound some thoughts regarding my friend because time in prison is of essence. Unquote. Rocks. Next. Well, uh, this is, uh, I purposely wanted to end with, with Tang Tai because it was in the year 90, in the 80s, when I was in Japan. I went to Japan and my wife is Japanese and my wife is a founder member of this group called Tang Tai. So she left that and came to India and spent time as a painter. But I have observed very closely the transformation of, of Tang Tai that incorporates all the elements that we have just described in your mind. That is what today's experimental exercises, both in terms of theatre, practice, performance, and art, are all about. Actually, that's my wife's work in, my, in 1985. Yeah. The artist collective Dump Time was formed in 84 by a group of students from different departments of Kyoto City University of Arts, Japan. Rejecting any influence of the Japanese art movements of the time, Dumb Type, a collective group, as described by one of their founder members, Teji Furuhashi. Teji Furuhashi unfortunately died away. Earliest, earliest intention was self-expression in any form. The group went on to create a new idiom, but of a fusion of art, dance, music, performance, and theater. And they did not shy away from the politics, unlike the traditional Japanese art forms. Dumb types, unique productions, high in technology, found an audience and acclaim outside Japan from the 90s onwards. Experimentation with many existing media, new technologies, has been an article of faith for dumb type. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, let's see the slides, and then I will sum it up. Yeah. 
This is all the performance. It was called dumb type because it was non-verbal. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to aim for. No role of the word. Music, that, that, that. No. Next. Next. I wish I could bring you, I have a lot, but I would, since I had asked the, how much time do I have, I was told about, about 30 minutes or so, <laughs> otherwise I would have brought you a number of, you know, cassettes to be able to show you, the VHS cassettes which we have transformed, you know, to be able to show you the entire evolution of time. Next. Next. That is Tate Furuhashi sitting there. I am witness to all this with my own eyes. Next. This would have been banned in India, nay? The dog is there. <laughs> Next. 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 Thank you. Uh, just sum it up. Experimentation with many existing media and new technologies has been an article of faith for some time. To such an extent that one project can appear in various forms of representation, including performance, installation, printed materials, and other possible inputs. Flexibility. The evolving process of work, a work in progress. Uh, work in progress, nature of their art practice is consistently reflected even in their day-to-day -day exper experimental matters. With very few projects, the entire team is reshuffled, a new director, and, and mind you, the director is not the boss. The director is not the boss. It's contradictory. Matter. With every new project, the entire team is reshuffled, the new director and staff are appointed from among the members following a series of discussions. As their projects move beyond the college premises onto the international stage, Dumb Type has actively sought collaborations with international professionals. A host of artists have been, uh, have been the members of Dumb Type, including Shiro Takatani, Tadashi Takamai, Ryoji Ikeda, Takao Kawaguchi. Many Dumb Type members have their own individual art practices, yet some are still engaged in Dumb Type. Their works are focused on a wide range of issues. Now that's what I want to do. The relationship between body and space, consumerism, sexuality, and identity, life and death. Hmm? These are integrated with strong visuals and high technology. Their social and political awareness further sharpened Furuhashi's infected HIV uh, positive is coming out in 92, strongly influenced the performance SM, 1994, which became one of the earliest art practices post, uh, focused on identity and politics of HIV and AIDS. Even after Furashi's death of an AIDS-related illness in 1995, Dump Type actively updates its members and evolved ever new creative strategies. I'm confident that the purpose and reason for taking you through this wide pantheon of images culminating into the kind of openness with which we need to address our creative efforts, I made my point. I can again reiterate and end. It's not where you buy your chicken from. <laughs> what matters is how do you think? How do you do with what do you do with it? And what does the taste at the end of Thank you very much for this patience. Thank you, Professor Ajib Lochen. It was a very strong presentation. Showed us 
the, the journey of an artist and the influences on him and what those influences actually caused him to do, things that he did. Rajiv Lochan is one of the foremost painters of this country and we are proud of his work. Well, could you see the possibility of words, what words are doing, what the textual narrative is doing to the visual narrative? Tahe ahir ki chohariya, chachiya bar chach pe naach nacha beautiful. If this could be an inspiration for a painting, it would be wonderful. And that is what Rajiv Lochan was able to show us. Thank you, Rajiv. And now I have on my list Mr. Sandeep Chatterjee of the... <coughs> yes, some technician there, please. I can move back. No, no, it's fine. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Start with you. Okay. He's, he's ready. He's ready. So he can, so he can start. Yeah, In the yeah, meantime, so you can fix it. So you just your name was say second, so I thought you have to I can start. Ah, yeah, of course. Then we keep to the original. Yeah. I will read it twice. Uh, so it's a very, I think it's a very clear 
the poem which has got carried in This poem is called A Strange Darkness. In this strange darkness descended upon the day, the finest vision belongs to the blind. The world is led by the counsel of loveless, pitiless ghosts. And upon the hearts of those that yet believe in light, in the undying flame of man's enduring quest, highlands and vultures east. I read it once more. In this strange darkness descended upon the day, the finest vision belongs to the blind. The world is led by the counsel of loveless, pitiless ghosts. And upon the hearts of those that yet believe in light, in the undying flame of man's enduring quest, hyenas and vultures feast. I think this idea of darkness uh, is essentially, for me, it's essentially about the 20th century, the uh, later part of which I have grown up. And it has always troubled me, I have always had to deal with this idea of darkness, which is also uh, expressed in Rabindranath Tagore's uh, essay. Uh, I, I felt Somewhere, you know, because I'm a teacher and I teach uh, students in a film school, uh, I always have to define it at some point, you know, to, to make things simple, to go towards uh, you know, something which has more clarity. I have to find a way to tell that, you know, what is the work that you are doing? What is the purpose? Uh, why you are telling a story? Or what is the story for that matter? And Somewhere I think we need to tell stories to, uh, to throw a little bit of light you know, on this uh, strange darkness that has uh, befallen us. And it is from that point was that I think through ages, the film institute was made in 1960, that a generation of teachers have probably been telling their students that uh, you need to come up with something new. You need to tell new stories, uh, more so because you are know, kind of subsidized by the government of India and you have a privilege. So you have a kind of a burden on your shoulder and you have to do something meaningful. You have to come up with some new stories. You have to throw light on new ideas. You know, this kind of thing has always been. Uh, trying to tell students when they first uh, come into the institute, uh, trying to make them aware of their responsibilities. So when uh, when uh, I'll, 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 I'll deal with this idea of forgiveness. Eventually, I would like to mention Niti Bhattu also over here. Uh, Niti Bhattu is a very, I don't know if everybody here knows her, her Bhattu. Uh, he's a very uh, influential filmmaker from India who made films during post independence. And one of his films, like a film called Shubhattu Reka, which is like a magnum of us. You see this uh, line where, um, where the uh, main character, the woman, uh, she says that, you know, where is, she tells her elder brother, this, where is my new house, where is our new house, and <coughs> it's a continual search for that new house. And that same question comes down at the end of the film. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a film in a form. So it, it comes down at the end of the film to when this lady's uh, little child, Bean, asks his mama, who is his, the same man, who was the elder brother of his mother, the same question that, uh, you know, 
<coughs> there is the new house. I'm sorry. <coughs> and where how to find it? Where do they find it? And I think it's not just about India, but all over the 20th century, we have been trying to find this. It's either a new house or a new story. And it has always been going like that. And it's a it's a very elusive thing. We've never been able to find that uh, <coughs> the new home or the or the new story also I think uh, which we are continuously trying to see. Uh, but saying that, you know when every time you know students they come up with uh, they come up with their uh, versions of new films or new stories which has influenced them. I'm still talking about the current times. And though we say that we look for something new, we face a major challenge there. You know, the moment they come up and say that, you know, these are the new films uh, that we have, you know, that, that we are influenced by, and these are the, this is the kind of newness in contemporary Indian cinema, you know, which really, really kind of uh, attracts us. And uh, when I encounter with the kind of newness in this, uh, which the students are uh, influenced by, uh, and that kind of, uh, you know, feel a kind of revulsion. Because, because of reasons which I will mean, tell you, I'll try to elaborate in brief. Take the names of some films, you know, I'm not a traditional academic. I can say what, I, uh, what I'm highlighting here. Uh, there is a sense of uh, falseness in these films, there is a sense of uh, stereotyping and a kind of sensationalism which is associated with all these films, which seems to be working with the uh, name ideas. Um, so one tends to tell the students that you know to don't go for this kind of don't go for newness for that matter, you know. Go towards the old, you know, look for the old. Maybe we can only find find the new through the old. <coughs> that is that has been the that has been my experience also, my personal experience too. I've always uh, hit upon something new that I associate with and when I'm comfortable with only when I dig a little deeper I look at the hole and I look at the I look at history. Maybe I, I, I always find that route of finding newness uh, you know, more uh, appropriate. To name some of these films which uh, our contemporary students are attracted to and which uh, with a lot of caution and difficulty we try to highlight things that where, you know, what is exactly lacking there. Uh, I won't show that film here, it's a, it's a, 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 this is just a test case, I'm just mentioning something and I don't mean any kind of offense to the people who have made film. I mean, they're very, very popular films in YouTube. I suppose this particular short film has got uh, millions and millions of how many hits, and they're popular, and they, uh, a lot of people like them actually. So I, I run a risk when I uh, kind of counter it. This uh, film is called the film, and the name of this film is Chutney. I don't know if you are acquainted with this film. So Chutney, I am not getting into the details of the film, you can maybe after this also later in the evening you can find it on YouTube and you can just see it if it interests you to know what, what I am talking about. Chutney is, um, as the name suggests, you know, and there is a kind of brand of film in our times where the reality uh, is being used almost like, you know, like tomato ketchup, you know, like, like something that is to real liberally sprinkled on your uh, product, uh, making more uh, quote-unquote artistic or quote-unquote meaningful or uh, quote-unquote serious cinema. Chutney I find, I found a, 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 found a, 
kind of ideal example of that. Uh, because uh, there is no sense of compassion in that film. He, I mean, the film, the kind of stereotypes, uh, particularly a place uh, like hell. So it, it's, a, it's set in Delhi, it's set in an area called Gaziabad, um, and uh, it's stereotypes of uh, it, it is very probably a very unique. Is to and then uniqueness in the character or the characters who live in Gaziapur. It seems Gaziapur is full of unique people, but uh, with that kind of stereotype, you are you know, you are and there are murders happening there. You almost kind of uh, tend to assume that uh, no such people you will find in Greater Kailash, for example. You should have an idea of uh, South Delhi. You know, you won't find that kind of thing in Greater Kailash. So. <laughs> So though in, on one hand there is a kind of meanness uh, or a kind of certain reality or a, or a kind, of certain, kind of common people uh, or a regular people from regular life with a severe tone of uniqueness we are encountering in these in films like these. But, but we are at the same time, uh, you know, it is somewhere different. It is somewhere different from the bad old, you know, from the bad old commercial cinema of India. When we grew up, we were told, like, don't look at this film. You know, there are better films. There is parallel cinema there. Is, yeah. So don't look at this uh, kind of bad old uh, commercial film. I'm saying bad and old because it comes from the it comes from the 70s uh, or 80s also. But after that commercial film, in one way, according to me, seized. And through 90s, what came up uh, was Bollywood. Uh, and it's a, it's a misnomer. Even if you, then if you do a uh, Google search, even Google will show you Bollywood films from 1930s or 1940s. So according to Google or so many other, maybe I don't know which other universities, you know, probably uh, from uh, Shankaram to Favelke to Buddha, everybody is Bollywood. You know, which is I think completely a misnomer. Bollywood, if one, one is really seriously looking to it, I am not, not really, I am aware of it, but I have not put real research into it. But I know for certain that Bollywood is a foreign age which happens primarily around the uh, early 90s when a certain kind of change in the world happens. I mean, with the 90s, I, I, I say that also because I happened to have passed out of the film school in 1990 and I got into a world which suddenly uh, everything changed. You know, right? you know, I, I, I suppose you know, how from 89 to 90 things uh, suddenly changed. And so with Bollywood, uh, Slowly, and, and you can now see that phenomenon all across the world. I'm talking and focusing on Bollywood. But everything, I mean, everything that was bad and commercial or before is somehow you know, left out. And what we focus on it is a kind of uh, very savvy uh, kind of uh, storytelling. And you try to see, you see your, your teacher including a lot of taboo topics or which were earlier taboo or which is, uh, uh, which is like, um, which are not seen earlier uh, in that kind of stories. Or you are seeing a degree of reality also maybe on it with films like these. You know, some other films, as an example, I could mention a film called Lunchbox, uh, which is made with a foreign producer, or even a film like Pitli. Which one of my ex students had made again set in Gaziabad, and an example of horrible stereotyping of uh, Gaziabad. So, on one hand, uh, on one hand, uh, it's not from through the 90s that something new uh, or a, a kind of loosening up a kind of wider acceptance or a look at reality is that it happening through a lot of these films and of course beyond 90s there was no parallel cinema as such you know that activity of the government stopped supporting 
I mean, it's, it's only later after 2000 that uh, NFTC revised the device again in a particular way and which kind of, which brings out you know, this brand of realism in uh, Indian cinema. So, of course there is a need for the new and a kind of new narrative to find it. Uh, but are we coming up with that? Or if we are not coming up with that, why is that so? I think one of the reasons why is that so is with the coinage of Bollywood or the birth of Bollywood, what also happens is the traditional uh, film industry is in Bombay. I'm just taking Bombay as it is. I think it happens everywhere else. The advertisement industry, I think, takes over the film industry. According to me, you know, that's largely what happens. And that has uh, ramifications, you know. So you try to, you know, it's a complete, uh, a kind, complete kind of branding or product, you know, that starts happening, uh, you know, through the early 90s and through uh, the beginning of Bollywood era. Uh, I suppose you are aware of you know, how generally, you know, a kind of factory mode of filmmaking or the old capitalist mode of, mode of production slowly dies down through 90s to when how uh, we see brands coming up and which is an idea, an idea to be sold. So you know, companies like Nike never say that I'm making shoes. You know, I'm, I'm only promoting an idea, I'm making a, what I'm doing, I'm creating an idea. So you start seeing you know, creation of ideas. Creation the word being, which, is, which starts uh, getting into uh, hand in love with you know, branding and other such activities. A short comparison if you do with uh, the good, the bad old commercial films and the uh, uh, kind of smart uh, sleep Bollywood films, uh, you can see that there is a, you know, the kind of uh, space that you share, uh, the kind of variety, so simply, simple thing like the variety of faces that you saw uh, in, in say a Manmohan Desai like a bad commercial film, which or quote unquote bad commercial film, say like uh, Apna Desh or, uh, uh, you know, uh, or or something like Rocky, say for example. The kind of variety of faces that you will see, the kind of variety of things that you will see, you, uh, that is uh, kind of short in you. You see very chosen kind of faces. There is the sameness in them, there is the sameness in the kind of language, the kind of English that slowly Salman Khan and others start speaking, you know. Uh, which is like a, which is like, you know, like, India would say, I'm great, that's the greatness of globalization. So, we lose out on specificity. Also, on one hand, we are losing out on certain specificities, on one hand, we are losing out on the kind of variety of representation that was there on the screen. And on the other hand, you know, uh, another kind of specificity is being <coughs> brought to uh, make the story more attractive, to give a certain uniqueness to the story. <coughs> now, in this scenario, you will see, you will also see, you know, apart from the world of cinema too, that uh, in case of politicians or big corporate uh, bosses, you know, they stopped using like, earlier there were cases, uh, you know, you're, you're dealing with a case, so they start, uh, this point also comes, uh, I think, maybe around the same time. Uh, that you are working with narratives, you know. And the narrative becomes a term which is used by politicians as well as by corporate uh, heads or companies uh, saying that, you know, we are, we are, we are searching for a narrative. Um, I, will, I will refer to a little bit over here. From a, in my, you know, search of you know, how I can teach better or how I can teach appropriately this whole thing about what is a story and how to find new stories, you know, it's difficult to find answers to be that rapidly also pointed out. But I, I have to look for answers because I'm, that's my job. I have to bring in some clarity for the students. Um, I found this uh, uh, kind of a lecture that uh, Nobel laureate, you know, author, Jane Quincy, gave at the 
World Literature Festival server in Norwich in the UK. It is available in 2012, I think it happened. It is available on YouTube. You can have a look later. Uh, so he also talks about, you know, how uh, he mentions in that article about uh, an Australian company, company called SBS, how they how they said that um, uh, they have uh, seven or six billion stories and counting. So you see, you know, they are coming up. There are so many new stories coming up through companies like these, uh, through new <coughs> companies like these, and there is also a story. There is also a newness in it, and uh, every day there are so many stories happening here around us. So that is also, you know, what he's pointing at, uh, which is starting, I think, around the same time. So I will give a little bit from there because he highlights some very important points here regarding a story and regarding newness. He mentions a very simple thing like uh, to tell a story, what are you dealing with? You know, are you dealing with truth or are you dealing with uh, a lie or falsehood? Like the uh, understanding of the word story uh, earlier was always like, you know, like Tommy, you are telling stories again. I am telling stories again. And concocting stories. So the story associated with the story was always a kind of lie. Yeah. <coughs> it's somehow with you know, this era that we are living in, there is an overload of truth, you know, and there, is, there are so many truths, uh, and everybody is coming up with truth. And there, is a, there, is a, there is so much of predominance of a subjective truth over objective truths. And so, you know, I have, a, I have my truth, and you have your truth, and he has a truth, and there is a, there is a, there is a surge of truth suddenly. And there is, there is no, on one hand, to be using a kind of common. Common, there's, a, there's an area of common truth which is probably going missing, or objective truth, which maybe science sometimes, you know, highlights or for, programs in a certain way. So, I will just uh, refer to one part from here, where the same I read it. So he is talking about uh, these prototypes. So he is saying that uh, be it a Bangladeshi rice farmer or a murdered sex worker, you know, there is a typicality of their lives, so a kind of universal aspect. So when you are representing them, somewhere you have to uh, you know, highlight that typicality or go by that typicality. But at the same time, he's asking a question, you know, do they also have some specificity? Is every Bangladeshi rice farmer equal to the other Bangladeshi rice farmer? So no matter how closely the life of one Bangladeshi rice farmer may from the outside resemble the life of another Bangladeshi rice farmer, each life is felt by its subject to be uniquely his own. This claim amounts to less than saying that each of us, man and dog, is master of our school, master of our fate. But it amounts to more than saying that we are born into a life which we will blindly give out. It is the space between these two positions, being the master of a life and being the vehicle of a life, that I am touching on here. So, it's either that, you know, I am I'm kind of the author of my own life story, or, you know, I'm just usual. You know, I am, I am, anyway, I'm born with a certain type, and I am, I am, that is my life story. I'm going on with that. So, he asked, uh, he asked an important question here that, so what is it to have a life? Is there a difference between saying every dog has a life and saying every human being has a life? Because is it only human beings who have a life story? Does a dog have a life story too? Does a barnacle have a life story too? You know, barnacle is like a thing which unloads a box in front. Does it have a life story too? 
or or or, the, or there are some live streams which are unique and rest are all mundane. So the problem that we face when we send our students to go and find subjects, you know, for a documentary or to look uh, for stories is that uh, where do you look for it? There has to be some unique uh, point. And of course, you are looking at Bombay or if you are looking at the lure of uh, in saying doing something significant and having a good life and making some money. So uh, obviously, it is about uh, finding something unique. Or is it so that you know there is that we are surrounded with all kinds of mundanities and maybe each one of it you know has a story. Each one of it is beautiful. But we are continuously somewhere that the dichotomy that we are facing is that either we go for a specific beauty or a specific story or something, or we you know look at mundanities and try to train ourselves maybe in a way to find stories because actually everything has a story and everything has a potential beauty. In art or in cinema for that matter, this whole painting to show beauty and to tell a unique story, you know, is how do we deal with that? That's the question. Well, that question is very, very accurate. I like this. I refer to this also in the course of my classes. Um, I think poetry very beautifully highlights that point. So, uh, what is the difference in the case of? So, he says that uh, the second query is that what is the difference in the case of human beings between having a life and having a life story. In particular, what cultural assumptions might I be making when I say I have a life, life story and it is my own? This later question uh, is asked because among the 7 billion or whatever billion of us, there are some who see it as no source of pride or self-validation to be told that their life stories are unique different from those of their neighbors. I, they, they would rather say that I live in a society uh, and my life is just a typical life. There is no uniqueness in life. So, the story of one particular man or one particular woman, whether it is a Bangladeshi rice worker, I mean, or rice farmer, or a multiple sex worker for that matter, the story goes, that is, the stories of others become meaningful and relevant to us by a process of sympathetic identification. It is not with the farmer as farmer or sex worker as sex worker that you identify. It is with the underlying man or woman, the being with whom we share humanity. If we identify with a stranger, then his story or her story becomes our story. So it is, it is a question of identifying with the human being. So there is this idea of the human being inside all these prototypes. I think that is what seriously uh, in films that I was referring to, uh, you know, the otherwise you know, very popular and very different, which are also known as Hatke films in uh, Bombay or Bollywood. Everything is Hatke now. Uh, so all these films, I think that's where they're going wrong. They somewhere they create uniqueness, they create very, very kind of typicalities, but they Someone impinge and find that human. They can't tap on that human, which is universal and with which you can identify with which you can go ahead. You know, you can see great performances. You know, like for example, in uh, if you call it great, like Jiska Chopra in this film called Chakni, I mean, she so accurately tries to play the other, but you won't be able to directly identify with that. Uh, if you sum up, I sum up. I uh, I just uh, move on to some three things. You know, I I wanted to highlight one more thing. I wanted to speak about my friend Afsar Ahmed. You know, he won his, he won the Sahitya Academy Award award this year. Uh, and he written about forty novels and some short stories and. I was again going back to students, you know, we have to also I make them identify sometimes that you know what, what is an artist like, what is an artist like, like because these days we are in an era where everybody is sexy, 
and you are always you know looking at an artist and, and I thinking of an artist you know who is uh, who has a certain gait, who has a certain you know elan. Uh, it's a kind of aspirational thing you know, to be an artist. So Afsar's life I find quite unique there. Afsar lives in Afsar. So say for example Afsar came to uh, accept his award from. The same time you said, I'm going to spray paint and airfare, and you'll go back and you'll get down in the airport, and then you will take a bus to go to Shapragachi station, and from Shapragachi you will take a train, the local train, and go to Bakulan, which is a few a hundred kilometers, and maybe 60 kilometers, I mean, I'm not sure about the distance. You will get down there, the cycle will be parked beside the station, you will take that cycle and you uh, go home. You know, at the, so that he, 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 he is, he is erudite, he is capable of becoming a professor in any university or any college, I think. But uh, he chose to write independently and he somehow lived with that. He has lived with very little money, uh, lives with very little money. He did a very small, small job in Bangladesh and he got a, a contractual job which pays him 50,000 rupees at the most he retired now. Two kids and wife, and somehow with the help from his extended family, he managed to build a small house. And that's the life he lives. If I tell you about the novel, you know, very brief, you know, what, he has, uh, what he has written. It's about regular people. It's about people living all around the you know, villages around that state. And it's about a man who's, who, who kind of uh, Webs on this another book here. I, I really wish that it is translated somewhere. Uh, he's a man who absconded, who just got lost one day. He used to live in that village too. He was in love. And four days before he was going to marry, get married to this woman, he suddenly got went missing. And it's after five, six years he surfaces again, and the novel begins there. He surfaces again and he the whole novel is just you know, he's going and going throughout the village, he is meeting every single family and they are all people, the poor people, the mundane people, you know, people, but everyone has their own stories and he's going and living with them and he's kind of one, you know, feeling the warmth of the love and the little existences they have and at the same time he's extending his help in whatever reason he's a man to do with her. So he is extending whatever help he can give. But he's never somehow going to, he's anticipating and he's never going to meet his lover who's, who's got married by now and has a kid. And everybody considers him as like a saintly man, a great man. He's in the meanwhile, he's married, he's also got married, he's found a wife, he has a kid in Vilashpur. And from Vilashpur also he suddenly disappeared and resurfaced here. And he lives with all these people for a few days, he helps them, he gives them, you know, things. And he shares basically the you know, the sadness and happiness uh, with all these owners and then again disappears one day mm, without meeting you know, the lover uh, who he was um, going to be married. So it is a story like that, you know, about common things, about very, very mundane things. And I, I can't tell you how really he knew that is. In this, in this whole landscape, how the story uh, would stand out, a very new story. So, so it lacks all the fashionable name in one way. I would like to just the one small clipping I would like I want to show you, but I will show you one and if I get the permission I'll show you the second thing or if you have to be in of, of trying to locate the newness in any way in a world. You know, if you are trying to locate newness, where to find that uh, newness? I will show you just one uh, five minute scene to begin with from this South Asian director called Sani India, he's from Taiwan. Uh, he made this film uh, called What Time Is It Now? sometime in the early 2001, 2, 3 maybe. Mm -hmm. We just see the first scene of the film. We just see how the film is handled with the it's like a small film inside that film sitting there. If you, even if you don't see the rest of the film, just that much is in the film. There. There's a story there, there's a narrative there. The whole film begins with 
Sound is on.
and you see a sun you know, going with his ashes somewhere. I'll quickly show you just the other sequence to kind of round it up in the other side of the spectrum, more dramatic approach where you see the last, the very last scene is just a five minute or four minute scene of, uh, this is a, a film made by uh, Roman Polanski, it's a classical uh, subject, that it's an adaptation of Oliver Twist and you see how in the last scene, the, and he kind of adapts it very faithfully otherwise, the film. But still the film makes a little difference. It makes a little difference, it becomes so evident in the last scene. Where you see uh, Oliver, who is now again gone back to his foster parent and his uh, kind of survived a good thing, and he's fine, he's a he have a good life. And he goes to meet uh, Hagen, who was, who was the kind of king of thieves in the prison and he's going to be hanged the night before he goes to meet him. And the film ends with that. So we just see the scene where Oliver meets him.
you can tell them, I'm going to say that when they hear you. You get me out of your brain, you need to go. so much. Can you come here? Yeah. Friends, I made a mistake. I didn't ask you to get into the discussion with either Rajiv Lochan or uh, Sandeep Chatterjee. Now, if you have any specific questions, then please direct them to you. You can talk to any one of them. There are no questions. It's okay. It's all, it's all right. You did very well. No problem. Are you ready? Stephen Blasky. You have to choose another input now. Right. This is another head. Why don't you come here? Would you like to move it? You know, you had, you had uh, one table, one now the other. You don't have to choose another input. When it happens, you have to use it. I can make it under USB stick, but no, it's. Uh, Stephen, you can come here if you like. I think that may be. Yeah. So I need some help because I don't have an app. No problem. Take your time.
Yeah, so um, now we have a bit of time for, for this particular end, and uh, I have the next meeting, so I can actually do it. First, I try to still go through everything, but uh, make it more advanced and uh, and very chilly. At some moments.
you, you did not ask him to. I mean, would you, if you die, want you your picture to be in that newspaper? So there was a big moral discussion, is it allowed to show it or not? And we used this discussion at one stage to talk about this question. Um, so on the one hand, we are always using documentary, documentary material, really material to take out of the everyday world. On the other hand, we try to create new experiences for our actors. So we don't just write a play based on documentary material, but we go on, we travel to them, we make research together. And so for us, it's important that they really make an experience that they can then also express on stage. So we went to the main actress to this place where, where this uh, boy um, died. And we, yeah, we went to the refugee camps in Greece, in Turkey, and also in Congo. So, but uh, this is the, um, coming back, what I just started with our PowerPoint, this is a quotation from the play. Um, so for us, and uh, the main actor says this sentence, theater for me was a messenger arrives and reports from the home and cruelty of the world. Describes a battle detail, only the battle, the massacre. This is theater for me. Mm -hmm. Like God. So this is a bit this position. And you have this tool like the dramatic theater who plays everything and reacts it, or the, you could say, post-dramatic, pre-dramatic, but the way of uh, storytelling. So we yeah, have these are the three uh, possibilities and three tragedies. And um, I just told him to about it without the phone. And uh, yeah, and then in the end you had like this kind of a um, like platform which was rolled out and then you saw the course. So you never saw the murder on stage, but in the end you they presented you the course. <laughs> this is how they did a reenactment of how a tea tragedy was staged. So, now talking about our own work, we use a bit like both kind of um, dramaturgies, the one uh, of re reenacting events and staging them and showing everything, and the other one is more using the messenger perspective and just telling, making only storytelling, and this is the European trilogy where we only have actors on stage that were talking from their biography. So I start to talk about the um, reenactment with uh, which uh, Milo the director and working with, became famous. So he started to reenact the last days of the Ceausescu's. This uh, maybe it's not a long here, but um, it was a dictator couple in Romania. I a, yeah, Romanian dictator couple. And after the fall of the wall, they were they got a short process and they were executed immediately. So Milo restaged this process against this couple. So on the left side you see the original picture that was broadcast in the television at the time. And on the right side you see here our actors playing it. So speaking about images, the first image is if you have this historic images, how do we react them? For example, the colors are always yellowish between because the media at the time, like the television and, and everything what recorded it was yellowish. But the original room was white. So even when you make the stage design and for your reenactment and you try to be very cheap, very close to what had happened, really reenacting it and playing it again, you have to decide. Do you choose for the for the white wall, what, what it was in reality, or do you choose for the more yellowish wall which looked like a media? So what is your reference? Is it media image or is it the looking mm -hmm. event and what is what is real? Um, and then you choose some actors that at that time, when the uh, was were in power, were the state actors. So they were also really involved in this. It, for us, it's always important that the actors are not just any actors, but that there was a connection between those who perform on stage and the story they are performing. And in this case, actors who have been famous actors during the dictatorship, they, they played the end of their years. And then, of course, you always have to frame it and you have to decide where it's if you make this really, really uh, reenactment, uh, where does the room start? Where does, yeah, where, what's the frame? And of course, the interesting thing is that, yeah, what I just said, for us it's important that it's um, this is a quotation from Neil, that it's not only the original material that we use, which is real, but that there is also a strong 
uh, real is happening on stage in the sense of what does it mean if these actors play these roles? I wait one second for the picture. Okay. So, um, and then the strange thing with these kind of reenactments is that then in the end you produce pictures of this event and then they get mixed with the original pictures. So it happened that some newspapers years later who wrote about a couple of Georgescu's, they didn't use the original pictures of the Georgescu's, but our actors playing it. Because, as you know, I mean, people are just doing bad research in, in media nowadays and they just Google the names of the dictators and they <laughs> use these pictures. So history is also rewritten with that. And you have it in art history, you have and in theater history, you have, for example, Marina Abramovic, who does it like she's reading acting famous performances and in that way she's um, also occupied, occupying them for itself. So if, it, if we speak about pictures, the second project me and I was doing was about the genocide in Rwanda and then he decided to go against the pictures because if you have these genocide pictures, I mean you know them, but how could you show this on stage? So we decided while uh, George Eskut was really a remake of the, the original pictures, this was the opposite, and he decided to make a radio show. Um, so we only were, and it was a really live radio show, and everybody had uh, earphones, like the old, the old audience had, uh, was sitting there to hear the like radio show. And then you heard people, and it was a true radio station that was um, paid by the state, and they uh, have like, uh, were raising the tensions between the Hutu and the Hutus. So they said, yeah, the Hutus, you have to kill them, and uh, if you know somebody, tell us where, he, where, he's, where he's hiding. So a bit, I don't know if I can say this, but what's sometimes happening here at the moment with them, okay, against Muslims, maybe. It started with a radio station that was really pushing against the minority. And then they, took, they met for half a year, and then the situation was so violent and happy that they really started to kill people. So, but it all started with the radio station uh, 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 talking against the minority. So, this was uh, one yeah, this very first project we were doing, and that was a reenactment. Re and then we did this other trilogy where we casted actors where we thought they had interesting stories to tell, and we asked them to come on stage and to tell their own biographies. So, this was only storytelling. Always four actors on stage. Once about the wars on Balkan, formerly Yugoslavia, Serbia, Bosnia, and one the Balkan Empire. Also about the refugee situation now in Europe. And there we again talking about reality. We always reflect the position of the actors. So in this case, for example, we have Maya Morgenstern as one of the actresses. Maybe you have seen the movie of Mel Gibson, Compassion of the Christ. So he made, Mel Gibson made a Hollywood movie about the last uh, dying of Jesus. So she was playing Mother Mary at that, in that movie. So her whole world was crying um, because her son was killed and tortured and murdered. So we took her on stage and she was telling about it, this kind of role that she was playing. While on the other hand we had two actors from Syria on the stage who were really tortured. And they talked about their tortures and their experiences, so this is Arno, and here he shows a picture of the, of the prison where he was in, in Syria. And then together with Arno we went there, because for us it's really important to, to get this kind of experiences, and we went to Syria in the north of Syria, <coughs> where the Shmerka were fighting with ISIS. And uh, yeah, there you see the Peshmerga fighters, the Kurdish fighters, um, protecting their Kurdish and Yisidi uh, people. So this is for us uh, quite essential. And then we make videos and we put these videos back on stage in the show. So here, for example, he's telling yeah, that there was an attack in this whole hometown. But this was the biggest discussion, and now coming back again to this question of what pictures are we allowed to show on stage. There was Ram Rami, another actor, and his brother disappeared in Syria. So he was uh, captured by the regime, and they don't know where he is. 
And I don't know if you heard about the story that Caesar was the person called, or it's just nick his uh, nickname. He was uh, working for the machine, and then he changed the size, and uh, he took pictures of everybody who was tortured and killed in the uh, prisons of Assad in Syria. So he took 12,000 pictures of dead people, and he put them all online. So you can imagine what this means, 12,000 people that are in prisons, and all their relatives, their friends, friends, uh, you know, that they don't know where they are. So they all have to look on this database, trying to find their loves, their brothers, their, their fathers. So this is, of course, what he also did, like watching 12,000 pictures, searching for his brother. And so we also discussed a lot of times, is it allowed to show his dead pictures, pictures of dead people on stage or not? Finally, we showed 20 of them, and also the one where he thinks that it's his brother, but he cannot be finally true. So this was a big discussion after we represented uh, the show in Germany. Why do we do it? Is it allowed? Because we have, um, like since the 1980s, in Germany and France, we have the debate of we are not allowed to show the victims. This was a big debate coming up after the movies about the Holocaust. Like there was Claude Lanzmann, a movie maker from France, who said, um, you, even if there would be pictures of Holocaust uh, victims, I would never show them. I would rather burn them instead of show them because that's again a violation of the victims. So why do we do it? And the only way of dealing with it is having the witnesses talk. But only talk and everything is in your imagination but never show it. So maybe you also had this discussion then when uh, Steven Spielberg and Chinta's system. This was a bit of a breakthrough where they started to make fictional movies about uh, the Holocaust. And since then the debate is still on board. So this was our contribution. <coughs> okay, yeah, what can be shown, what can be told on stage? The other debate is what positions do you want to bring on stage? I'm now talking not about pictures, but about the narration and uh, the political positions. One other project that Mio was doing was the State. And maybe you heard about Pajvik. He was a uh, right wing from Norway, Norwegian. And he killed 200 young soldiers. So teenagers who went uh, on a camping and he on an island, and he just went there and killed 200 people because they had, had another political opinion. Than him. So his final speech in the court, where he said, "But I'm not guilty. I was, I'm just defending my country because um, all the refugees coming in, so my country is destroyed, and I'm just um, defending my country." So this speech we brought on stage, and there. Because there was also the discussion, why do you give this position a stage? Why do you stage this kind of right wing populist um, arguments? But we found it interesting because, of course, in German theater you only have, you don't have the right wing people sitting, as the, li li the liberals and the left wing anyway. So they are already critical towards this thinking. But it's amazing to, to really listen to it for two hours and to hear these arguments and to see where they even fit to what I personally think or not. I mean, it's really, they are not stupid. They are quite clever in their arguments. But of course, it's uh, not tolerable what they are yeah, saying do. OK, and then maybe the last example of this kind of yeah, talking and showing things that maybe we should not present is a project we did five easy pieces about a mass like a child murder organization. He, um, he took six children, brought them in the basement, and raped them for many weeks and a month, and finally killed them. And we played this with the children. So this was, of course, kind of a difficult topic. But we thought um, this makes really clear the topic and the sens sensitivity. And we had one educator on stage who was at the same time a bit like a, not playing the rapist, but playing the director. So he took the function of a director and told the children that now please play the scene, now let's talk about this topic. So this was about also a reflection about what are we doing here. If we do theater with the children for an adult audience, isn't that already like a kind of voyeurism? And isn't theater always voyeurism? And how can we protect the people on stage if they are not, if they are still young or if they are, if 
if you have failure to protect them. But of course, <coughs> children are much more clever than you mostly think. Um, so there we uh, researched adult actors who look like the children could look like in 20 years. And we made videos with the adult actors and had the children being acted. That, so that it happened at the same time. And that you get a bit of the feeling that if you're born as a child into a world, then you just see what the adults are doing and you're imitating it. That's how we learn. And that's how all cultures uh, constantly continue it. Because you learn what the adults are doing and you repeat it. So this, of course, was the most difficult uh, scene of this play where a young girl was, yeah, she spoke the lines of the victim that was captured of the crew, and finally she was freed, so we had her letters and, and her analogies. Yeah, but, but what does it mean to play this? So the final scandal, of course, I mean, because, you know, maybe the 120 Days of Sodom from Pasolini is one of the movies in the 20th century which is most discussed, and we made a theater version out of it. Um, but we had again, we asked um, handicapped actors to play it. Because, I mean, what is about to talk about people who are just killed nowadays? Uh, and at the time, he, uh, he said, in, um, yeah, he, he was doing kind of critique against Nazism, um, fascism. And we were thinking about those people who in our society are all killed, these are handicapped people. Because if parents get the uh, diagnosis that their child will get uh, handicapped, they just uh, they kill it in the, in the stomach, like it's not born yet, but uh, so 90% of them just uh, aren't born anymore. So we were thinking about what, how can we transfer this kind of, you are not part of the society anymore, we just kill you into an experience of people who are really on stage. So we did this with um, people who had trisomy 21, trisomy. And uh, of course there we also had this Christian symbol again, because Pasolini was very uh, doing a lot of Christian movies, also like uh, Ashna. Yeah, it was for the to St. Matthews. So, um, yeah, this is coming back to this question, what can we show? What, what produces uh, pity? What produces compassion? And I think there was a, I think we have to overcome this feel, like this Catholic, Catholic uh, feeling of guilt and always speaking about guilt and I feel bad and I am yeah, guilty. But we really have to talk about responsibility, so about the future, how can we overcome uh, special positions and uh, special problems. So this is something that I am interested in, to not only speak about this, what has happened. I mean, of course you have to speak about everything that has happened. In the Germany, we like doing it about uh, how many Jews we, we killed. So, Germany is a really cu a culture of really accusing themselves of what they have done, and I think it's good, but it's not enough. You have to see what has to be done and how you can take over responsibility. So, this is a bit what we find with other um, formats, but this is still going to find out. I mean, we are, beside the theater project, we are also doing <coughs> where we really try to be political. And for, in Moscow, we uh, did a reenactment of a trial against Pussy Riot. Have you heard about them? Pussy Riot is a uh, music group that was accused. This play is performed or it is being? This was done. We this did it done. three years ago. So we went there and we asked everybody who was involved in the process to come on the DT scene for three days and we and do the process again, but now under like care conditions and not under the law of Putin who was of course influencing the judges. So it was a team project, but in the end, um, yeah, they had to decide are you, I mean, it's always symbolic to say in the end that now we're free, but it's also of course a strong symbol and a strong motivation. And we did it at the place where, um, where things originally happened. But then, of course, the state police came and tried to kick us out and said, we are part of the fire. And then, of course, I came with weapons. So it's um, like, you know, the Russian system of uh, 
This was in Moscow. This was in Moscow, yeah. And then of course the state television came and they made fake, fake news about like all foreign nations try to influence our society and uh, this is I mean it's really strange how But you were allowed to perform. We yeah, I mean we, in the beginning we didn't announce it officially, we just made it in the Sakharov Centrum. But after three two days they got the they were informed and then they came and tried to block it. But the funny thing is because it was a, a trial that we were reenacting, we had a lot of lawyers in the room, so they of course helped us. And he, like you see the right person on the right, so he's the anchor man of the Russian state television. So he was included in our project to take over the, the position of the government. So of course when then the police came and we met, he said like, no, here are like 20 international journalists, don't interrupt here, it's, it's just theater. Because he understood what it means to I mean, they take this game as long as there is no international media. Mm. But if you have international media, of course, in the next day, you have it everywhere. So this is this kind of power game that you always have when you make artistic projects. And then we did the same in Congo, but not about the cases that were already done, but saying we have to have a tribunal there because there were so many things going on and there was no justice at all. Especially like European enterprises coming and destroying the country, taking out gold, Bhutan, working together with the corrupt um, governments. So why not make a tribunal against government and the enterprises? And we did it also again as a theater project three days in Congo against these uh, companies and of course against the local government because there was a massacre also when we were there. Um, yeah, so these are the political projects we are doing to really work, yeah, to step up our community and theater for art people by like really in, influencing society. And it's the, the last project that we did like 100 years after the Russian Revolution. We said, what kind of revolution would we need today? So we stormed, you know, the Petersburg, like we stormed the German Reichstag. <laughs> um, after having three days of discussion, what has to be changed in the world? What should the German politics do better? And for that, we invited like 60 people from all over the world to discuss this topic. What, what should we change? And from the reason, unfortunately, we did not have anybody from India. And I'm sorry for that. We had uh, Kushita Mir from Bangladesh, and you know her, and Nasir Mansur from Pakistan. So it was about labor conditions in the world and all these kind of topics. And we think that it's really important that artists um, try to, uh, to do, yeah, to mix their work with activists. And hopefully we will continue this general assembly like every one or two years in a different country. And hopefully we will also come to daily some day. This will be great. Thank you very much. Well, friends, would you like to ask any question from Stephen Blaske, any question? Yes, please. I thought I had a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll try to sum some of them. First of all, uh, the play last night was followed was really in, 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 all, in all the little things I tried to do. I, I love how you tried to, you know, juxtapose over some contradictions as in those little terms like you're shot by this voice image, but uh, what, what would happen to you if you don't come to know about the uh, Rwandan genocide? I mean, everything. That was a, it had beautiful threads like that. But a lot of my questions come from like, you try, most of what you're doing is blurring the, uh, blurring the, that thin line between reality and art. You're kind of mixing all, all, all as you go and you're crossing over a lot of this stuff. At, at what point, at what point do you, do you, like, do you just hold yourself like, okay, now we have to stop ourselves? Like, there was a moment in last night, you, uh, she joked about the fact that our director uh, wanted to call uh, Anna's father. And so, like, these moments, there, there must be a lot of these moments that come across in your world. So, how do you, like, brace yourself, okay, now we have to hold ourselves at this point, we can't go any further than that. And how did you find a fascination for this sort of stuff? Yes. <laughs> this, this is the question. I'm, and the third thing I would like to ask is, the risks, I mean, how big a group are you? I mean, to synthesize this amount of information, the, 
I, 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 can, I can bet that there's a lot of risk that goes with it. We talked about Pasolini. Pasolini was scared for his views. He was a homosexual, so he was scared for his views. So what are the risks you face when you when you actually go up in the field to gather these, this sort of information? I mean, there's a lot of things I want to ask, but I don't know. I'm not even coherent at this point. But just, this yeah. is more of an appreciation, kind of an admiration to what you do. So thank you for this. Yeah, I mean, the risks, of course, are when we go to Iraq, a little more so, but uh, yeah, you have the ISIS uh, fighting fish I grew up in the middle of this time. So there I grew up, I was seeing a lot in Congo also. But I think for the rest, if you're not just in this kind of, um, of dangerous areas where it could happen that the village falls down, right. then it's not so risky because in the end we are artists and we are from Europe, so we are kind of privileged. So even if we go to Moscow, yeah, you did I don't know, even, even if they try to put us in prison, we know that the German embassy will in the end try to help us all this embassy. So of course we are privileged, but we, I think because we are privileged, we have to use it. And we have to use this power to go somewhere to, uh, to point on the things where maybe locals say, but we cannot do it if we would my family is in danger or whatever. So this is something which I feel a responsibility to also use our position to do this. And um, yeah, this fascination for these topics, uh, this, this is Milos. And uh, our director Milo Bao is really fascinated by all these kind of cool things in the world. And, Sometimes I also think, why the fuck do we always do this dark topics and stage topics? But of course, I mean, that's what really matters. Yeah. And of course, we, uh, maybe someday we will also make a love comedy or something. But at the moment, we feel like there is so much to do. And um, that's, I don't know, it's really interesting to, uh, to try to understand how the world and globalization functions and try to find a way how we do as an artist for it in the end has no power. But how you can do some kind of attraction that you got to get for some projects. And this is some symbolic capital that you have to really influence politics. And for example, in Congo, after we did the Congo tutorials, two ministers were dismissed. And of course, then there come new ones and they are also grew up. But at least we managed to, uh, to do something. And now like, people are really trying to uh, use this as an example. And we, like, we made uh, DVDs of it and, and made it into a, like, a language of the country and spread it all over so that they really get an idea of how justice could work and that they should change something. We do that for free and disseminate it. Yeah, we do it. Yeah, we are yeah, we're trying to get money in Germany at the moment. Um, so yeah, we have like we have hundred thousands now from just private donators who said it's a good thing, and then we can give it for free in Congo to everybody. So this is really a... Anything else? Uh, I mean, last time you clearly established that the actress was walking into a room. She clearly stated this uh, in a section, like, I don't, like, I don't need to scream anymore, I can walk into it. So, do you always tend to do this, or there are times when you leave your audience confused? Like, that are these actors on the stage, or are these actual victims that are on the stage? And do you actually ever perform with victims? Do you actually bring victims, or you know, or somebody who suffered those things you're talking about onto the stage or into your act? Have you ever done that? Yeah. I mean, normally it's even more clear what is true and what is not true. And the other projects, like the, um, the trilogy of you, which I talked about, there is clear it's actors who only talk about their private biography. It's very clear. And in other projects, it's clear they, they play roles. And in compassion, it's it's the project which is the most, most ambiguous because Gonzo Lachi is a really victim. Like, okay, but like, she has a really her story that she's telling. Whereas Rosina is a mixture of her own stories and stories of NGO workers who are really All right, thank you. Just one thing I would like to ask. You know, BTS highlighted ethical ability, saying you're doing this. What is your position? Because you're doing it. The ethicality of putting this on the stage, we are questioning that. Yeah. We just trying to make your own stance about my personal position. You are doing it on the stage. Yeah, I mean, we are. I am a doctor, and we are also directors, so we are very close to collaborating. And um, depending on the project, it's um, mostly it's the main work is the research to really go to places 
to me it's much different as possible that you decide which topic is interesting, which actors are interested. And then of course it takes a lot of power and energy to get money from the project and to get the people together. Because sometimes, I mean, this is also kind of what we do, that we bring people from opposite positions together. Like marketing and that bring together on one stage for these three days to really discuss the topic. Because we think then it's getting interesting. Then it's the concept that you have in normal tragedies. If you have two positions and they can come together, it's clear they will not find that they have to argue. So there, in the end, we are not, in the end, we are theater makers. We search also the conflict and not um, the activist solutions. But it's also for us interesting to see positions to learn. Yes, please. Uh, the same thing which I have been that uh, your pictures are viewed by a uh, people for, uh, from your play. The same happened with Gandhi, our Honest Minister of Honest Minister and we a statue in the UK, but they made the picture of a bank instead of paid the role of Gandhi in that place. So they, <laughs> that's it, they are there. So uh, one of the things I want to know, as you said that they were supposed to uh, show so many things, but yesterday we watched your play, in that play you have uh, shown she is kissing on the stage. So that is all. Oh. She is kissing on the stage. Kissing? Yeah. yeah. That was uh, strange, it was not allowed in Colombo or Calcutta. But uh, for the rest of us, I mean, yes. Yeah. Yeah. She played more than 100 times now. And for them it is okay, it's a difference of culture, you know, so for them it's okay. Yeah. Obviously. But of course it's a business kind of complication, of course, where you but yeah, I mean, she talks about the story about this person killed, so what is the real complication? This person or this feeling uh, what I mean, when I, talk, when I go to the streets, I see it like every few minutes. But it's only made, of course, this is very strange in this country. Or in many times, in most countries, like the public is only made, who you can see, of course, being. So, there, of course, is also kind of emancipation thing. And also, I mean, yeah, you see, it's, it's, it's only made also sitting here. So, I think there is a lot to do for emancipation everywhere, not only in consumer What to show and what not to show yes. is, is the question. Exactly. And, uh, you see, it is not only the responsibility towards the uh, state or responsible what what breaks the rules and so on. It, uh, it is also about the people. The, the responsibility to show what not to show to the people also. Because people may take certain things and may not take certain things. So that responsibility is also yours. Yeah. And also the company, the actors mm -hmm. who are performing. Yeah. So they are walking on the edge of a sword, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so all these considerations are there when yeah. you make a play? Yeah, we discuss it a lot, of course. And um, yeah, but in the end, I mean, it's, it's also this kind of thing that of course, you can always censor yourself, and you can always say there is, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. But in the end, the, the, the interesting thing is people debating about it. That you are in a theater, you have a platform where you can put something on which is um, maybe not politically correct and maybe provocative, provo but then people can go out and discuss it. And they, of course, they can have good arguments to say this should not be allowed or no problem with that. Like you make it or whatever. But I think it's the important thing is that you have a room where it's possible to discuss it. If, yeah. if you forbid it from the beginning on and you say it should not happen, yeah. then you are not a free country. So but then of course you can of course you can decide not to go to a show where a woman is kissing on stage. This is good uh, if you know it, of course. <laughs> this is the well friends, it remains for me to thank the three distinguished speakers and for a wonderful evening. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Sandeep, and thank you, Rajiv Locha. Thank you, sir, and thank so many, many thanks to all of you. Tomorrow's seminar is at 11 a.m. with a new subject and with new speakers and chair. I hope all, uh, I see you all, all of you there. Thank you.